The average Filipino purportedly suffers the heaviest tax burden in this part of the world and yet does not enjoy the kind of public service and infrastructure enjoyed in other countries. The clamor for income tax cuts has therefore been getting louder and louder. At the same time, business groups are also demanding other tax reforms, saying our tax system is not competitive within the ASEAN and the rest of the world. Good evening. I'm Tony Abad, and this is Political Capital. With us tonight, the Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee in Congress, Congressman Miro Kimbo. Welcome, Congressman Hi. Kimbo, Hi. and thank you for being with us. Pleasure, pleasure. Yes. Let's begin with the uh, famous House Bill 4829. What yes. is the purpose and vision of your proposed legislation? The main objective really is to address the biggest problem with the tax system. And the biggest problem is, is not just the high rates, but really the shallow tax base. Okay. Currently, there are 38 million Filipinos working in this economy, meaning making money out of it. Okay. And the 38 million is divided uh, into the wage and salary workers. Yes. There are 24 million of them. You have the professionals and then you have the entrepreneurs. So if you carve out corporations from the economy, these are the only individuals making money in, the, in, our, in the Philippine economy. Okay. But of the 22 million or 24 million wage and salary workers, 72% of them are actually exempted because they are minimum, minimum wage, wage earners. Okay. So roughly you have around 6 to 6.4 million Filipinos paying income taxes today, meaning among the salary and wage earners. So looking at the entire population of the Philippines, we're just down to 6.4 million. You're looking at 6.4 million Filipinos paying for almost 90% of total tax take of government from individuals. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the, uh, you look at the 14% of the, the rest of the pie of tax payments coming from individuals, that's divided between several millions of entrepreneurs and professionals, meaning lawyers, doctors, yes. dentists, uh, accountants, of which many of them don't pay. Okay. So the biggest problem really is that, meaning um, there are too many people who are not shouldering or sharing the burden of paying taxes. Okay. And uh, what would you attribute this to? I mean, what, what in the system has, has led to this situation? First is that the system is not very conducive for payment, okay. meaning if you look at the programs of the BAR, it has almost practically relied on the wage and salary worker because the payment is uh, certain, yes. meaning these are remitted by employers. If the employee does not pay it, you get prosecuted, you go to jail. Yes. If the employer is a withholding agent that's not remitted, you also go to jail okay. and you pay certain penalties. So there's been an over-reliance on that, mm -hmm. but very, very little effort okay. when it comes to profession and, and, and entrepreneurs. Well, and the second part is that the effort as far as the, the unser unserving meaning or the non-paying sectors is that instead of simplifying the tax structure so yes. that it becomes easier for them and at the same time rationalizing the tax rates, they're better off uh, no. uh, not paying at all, yes. meaning they bribe their way. I mean, that's common knowledge. Yes. It's very easy to look for these stores. I mean, if you're with the BIR, you already right. know where these hardware stores are, where these salons are, but still the figures don't change. In the last uh, five years, you've had prosecutions done, but uh, in the last five years, we've had a fantastic uh, conviction rate of one case. So should the government be worried about the about 30 billion that they said we stand to lose if we push, they support this effort? Absolutely not. Okay. I don't see any reason why government should be worried about that. Yeah. Uh, you're looking at the amount of money that we have not been able to spend over the last uh, two years. Uh, it's been computed at almost 520 billion in terms of underspending, okay. but of course that's going to be spent eventually. Yes, but but all we're saying is that there's 30 billion. The only thing that needs to be debated on is who will spend the 30 billion better. Is it going to be government or is it going to be the individual? Yeah. Because it's not going to be lost in the system. That will remain within the system, but this time instead of government okay. spending it, it's actually going to be the the taxpayer who will spend it. And we've shown that the, in terms of economic activity and bringing 
in uh, uh, growth, it's yeah. always uh, the private sector or the individual who can well, actually bring about more growth. About seven months to go and the end of the administration and the start of a new one, is it still possible to overhaul this 19-year-old tax system uh, given the dynamics that you're now facing and uh, you know, whether you can still push it through in both uh, chambers of Congress? We can't overhaul it. Uh, the speaker was correct when he said that we don't have time anymore for, to overhaul the entire system. Okay. But certainly, like I said, it's an eight-step process before we overhaul everything. Yes. So we can the, start with the okay. adjustment of, uh, to inflation of the tax brackets. I think that's something that's not okay. very debatable. Uh, it's something that uh, people will benefit from immediately mm -hmm. uh, within the next taxable year. So I think that, that first step is uh, quite realizable and something that we okay. can do over the next few at weeks. At the very least, no? Just at the very least. least. Yeah. At the very least, I think, it's, I think it's a very good signal to the people that we are on our way towards a more progressive and uh, uh, more compassionate tax system. Now, when we come back, the private sector's view on tax reform with Professor Ronnie Balbieran of UANP and the Reed Foundation. Please stay with us. You're still with Political Capital, and I am Tony Abad. Joining us is a lecturer from the University of Asia and the Pacific and an economist from the Reed Foundation, Professor Ronilo Roni Balbieran. What's your own take on, well, that proposed measure and what you see um, would be the, the way forward or what, what to do with our tax system? Let's take a look at uh, the purpose or the function of uh, taxation. Yes. So basically, there are two... Uh, functions. One is uh, you have to finance the market failure of a country. So there are two types. You have, you have market system when the buyers and the sellers have a healthy transactions with one another okay. and you satisfy the market. But on the other hand, you have situations wherein you have market failure. What are market failures? These are when the citizens demand it, but uh, <coughs> no company in the world would want to try to supply those particular demands, like, for example, okay. peace and order. Yes. Uh, no one would want to supply peace and order. Okay. Uh, free education for all. Okay. And, but to supply that, you need, you, you need some, some form of uh, resources for yes. the government. And the whole country benefits once we are all educated, yeah. once we all have access to our farms. So the market actually works better, works better when you have these public goods and you, available. No? And you jumpstart the ability of the citizens who are formerly marginalized, previously marginalized, by okay. the government stepping into the picture and providing those resources. And then you'll enable them to have participation in the economic growth okay. and development of That's the country. That's why you call it a redistribution yes, tool. Yes, your no? redistribution. Oh. So, so it's only because those who are earning would have interest in making sure that all these people who are left behind mm -hmm. to participate in this economic system, it is only just for them to contribute to the government's taxation. Okay. So that the government can do its job of redistributing those resources from those who have to those who have not. Okay. Because when all of us are included in that particular economic system, then we will grow as a country. And that's what we call inclusive growth. But the second portion is what we call the economic growth tool. Uh, especially in the Constitution, it says there that the Congress should evolve a progressive taxation okay. system. What does a progressive yeah. taxation system? A progressive taxation system is a system wherein as you grow your income, you are levied higher tax rates. Mm -hmm. uh, this is to make sure that when the country or the citizens are earning more, then automatically they have to pay more so that you don't encourage uh, whimsical spending and that will lead to overheating of an economy. Okay. So from the point of view of macroeconomics, it's an automatic stabilizer. When people, in general, earn higher, they are levied automatically with higher rates. Okay. But when the economy is in a slump mode, 
hits a recession, mm -hmm. all of a sudden we are earning lower yes. than before. So we also pay less. All of a sudden, automatically, okay. because of that progressive ta taxation, that you pay lower tax rate when you have lower income, then you pay lower tax and then you can have more money to purchase something. And that's where the bills on tax reforms are coming from. So lower the, lower the tax uh, that more, is being more to, spend. Know, more to spend so that the multiplier for the economy we will grow faster. This whole paradox of uh, when you lower taxes, uh, you actually increase collection. Uh, that's it, why yeah. sometimes the argument against, you know, uh, it seems that the government would, it's almost a sort, sort of linear in its, its argument that if you take away this much, then rev revenue will go down this much. Uh, it's a very mathematical and economic uh, procedure, but that they technically call it uh, elasticity. If you finance, for example, uh, investments yes. through, the, through the government, if those same investments can be financed by the private sector. The private sector finances its own investment without collecting any taxes from the people. Yes. If the government will produce those investments, roads, etc., buildings, yes. it will have to collect <coughs> it from the taxes. Mm -hmm. So if with the same investment, for example, one billion, one billion, the multiplier effect Okay. of uh, a private sector-led investment is much, much higher than a public sector investment. So this is where you are going to that uh, question, should we decrease tax so that we further encourage spending yes, and investment, investment. To, to encourage economic growth? That is true. Which, which may actually lead to higher collections. Yes. Okay. But the, how do we know? And then how do we, do we draw the line? Okay. Uh, again, we go back to the market failure. Those investments that can already be financed by the private sector, the government should, not, should no longer be uh, cracking its brain towards financing those investments. That's why you have the public-private partnership. Do you think that, you know, with about seven months to go, we can still, there's still some hope to overhaul our tax system? At the very core of the bill, which is adjust the bracket. Yes. <laughs> because the highest bracket it's is 500,000 and above. Yes. And you're paying 32%. And most likely, you and me are paying that high amount right. of tax. So, but... What is the proposal? What is the tax reform bill about? The core is just to adjust it to price increases that happened since 1998. So it's really just an adjustment for it's inflation. It's an adjustment. It's oh. a no-brainer. Okay. So the intention of the law in 1997 was that probably those who are earning 500,000 pesos were probably actually earning much. Okay. That At is time, probably yeah. so much in value, 500,000. But 17, 18 years after, what's 500,000 yes. a year? And then you deduct 32%. Okay. You're left with just less than 30,000. Sounds like a no-brainer to me. No-brainer. Yeah. And in fact, I would even push it radically that in the bill, you should already allow for an automatic adjustment in inflation yes. at the very least every year. Yeah. We have had laws, for example, in the 1940s, 1950s, with penalties of the crime, yes, for yes, example, right. 100 pesos. <laughs> 200 pesos. 200 pesos, yeah. 200 pesos during that yeah, yeah. time was uh, an expensive amount, yes. a high amount. I but right now, 200 pesos? It's nothing. I'm just going to yeah. commit yeah. Uh, an administrative penalties and then pay the administrative penalties. When we come back, uh, tax reform and the impending ASEAN integration. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're still with Political Capital. And with us, our guests tonight, Congressman Miro Kimbo and Professor Ronnie Balbieran. Beginning the end of this year, we're actually moving towards an ASEAN economic community, which goes beyond ASEAN free trade areas. So there's, there's actually integration of other aspects of economic activity, such as movement of finance and capital. No? And the implication there is you really have to look at 
and compare tax systems. No? How would this, uh, well, how would this uh, now play into our own uh, tax reform efforts? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you can't have the same tax regimes because we have uh, uh, different financial rules or even different constitutions from one country to the other. Yes. But since we have the highest tax rates in the region, both in terms of corporate income tax as well as individual income taxes, it, we strongly believe it's going to affect uh, competitiveness. Meaning, mm -hmm. the way moving forward, the ASEAN today is uh, the second biggest economic region as, as will be anticipated over the next eight years. Um, people are moving from China and they're choosing as to which countries to invest mm -hmm. in. To me, really, the competition is Vietnam. In terms of uh, effective tax rates, they have the lowest. Okay. Yet, in terms of tax collection or tax effort, they actually have the highest in the region. Okay. And now I understand the highest foreign direct investments are now recorded in, in Vietnam. Uh, they have a very high F yeah, <coughs> foreign direct investment, principally because of the large incentives that's also being given out. Mm. Uh, Professor Ronnie, how about in an integrated market, uh, how do you see tax systems work? I mean, definitely you have these separate states, but the market itself, the economy itself is, is going to be integrated, the movement of, of yeah. goods, services, so on. Uh, how do you sort of, uh, how would you retool tax systems ac across uh, an integrated market of, of separate states? Well, we start with uh, the integration. So you are looking at, for example, not just on markets, but actually on production, production networks. Okay. So you have one country <coughs> producing this part only, yes. uh, this country producing this part of the car only. So, uh, and you, you, you want to have as much as possible uh, a uniform income tax, corporate income tax for all these production networks. Otherwise, uh, it doesn't make sense. Uh, this is aggravated by the fact that the uh, Philippines has one of the highest electricity bill. So, so it's, just a, it's another form of tax to uh, mm -hmm. our, uh, our direct investments. So I don't see, like what the uh, congressman said, I don't see any possibility that all our corporate income taxes are the same. But at least you, you try to level it off with other fees and other expenses that the production, uh, that the firms will be facing as they, for example, uh, locate in the Philippines uh, versus Vietnam, mm -hmm. versus Thailand, versus Malaysia. So, uh, and uh, also you want, um, you want the, the same, so you have the producers and the consumers how about the consumers? You want the same take-home pay, as mm. uh, Congressman said. You, have, you want to have the same take-home pay. Otherwise, uh, let's just all relocate somewhere yes. else where we have larger take-home pay. This is aggravated by the fact that, for example, if you average the purchasing power or the, the per capita income of uh, Southeast Asian uh, nations, less Singapore and Malaysia, Yes. So we are above that. Uh, we are below that average. That average is around three thousand, okay. but our average uh, per capita income is just around two thousand plus. Okay. So would you so say we have the lowest take-home pay, actually? One of the lowest. One of the lowest, but but that's a and byproduct more. also of you know the way the economy has been running. Meaning we've always been the laggard, but yeah. I think this is also a bright spot because in a sense that we've also been having uh, substantial improvements in terms of per capita GDP over the last three years. But Professor Ronnie, earlier you were saying if you lower tax rates, you actually it's a way to spur spending and then in effect you, you, you generate uh, more economic activity. Yes. Isn't that something that uh, well, could be addressed also through the tax reform yes, you're yes. proposing? Especially that, uh, for example, uh, you, you, you have uh, you have here in Metro Manila mm -hmm. around $6,000 $6, per capita income. That's way above the average, uh, average income per, per capita income of any Southeast Asian uh, citizen. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have that potential to actually grow the economy uh, by lowering the, the income tax. You okay. start with Metro Manila, yes. you promote the investments outside Metro Manila. 
Region 4A and uh, Region 3. So there's really room for growth if you actually decrease uh, uh, income income tax. For example, uh, in in Thailand, it's it has one of the highest income tax around 35 percent, but they they levy it on those who are earning eight to nine million peso equivalent. Okay, yeah. so it's about brackets. No? <laughs> yes. It's, it's, it's fairly progressive in yeah. other countries. Uh, oh. I think it's been discussed earlier that uh, as long as the tax brackets remain frozen uh, okay. to 1997 levels, yes. you will have great inequity happening. In fact, with uh, the implementation of the salary standardization law 4 yes. by next year where 50 billion is, uh, will be received by civil servants, in a matter of three years, everybody in the civil service or in government, 1.4 million of them will eventually be in the top two the higher top brackets, high meaning okay. in bracket six and seven, paying okay. 25, 30, 32 percent. Okay. So um, that's obviously not the vision of uh, yeah. the pyramid right now is inverted. When we started in 1997, you had the top tier 32% where you only had 2 to 3% of the uh, taxpayers in that bracket. And a great number of them were in the 5 to 10 as well as 15% bracket. But that's completely reversed now because of the frozen brackets. Yeah. If you are not uh, going to legislate this uh, reform bill yes. that is not uh, adjusted to inflation, the bracket is not adjusted to inflation, but you have another tax... Uh, tax law that says all the the minimum wage earners are exempted from paying income tax mm -hmm. that that definition of minimum wage is adjusted based on the by, based, based on, on inflation yeah. so there will come a time that the highest bracket ideally ideally speaking that the 500,000 pesos which is the highest bracket may be the minimum wage yes <laughs> and everyone earning 500,000 and below will be exempted from paying taxes. So there goes your progressive system. <laughs> Professor and uh, Congressman, thank you for being with us and, well, very important message to the public. It is true that nothing is certain in life except death and taxes. But no matter what tax you pay or which bracket you fall under, it is also true that you expect a reasonable return on your contribution in terms of government service and infrastructure. In the end, the simplification of our tax system and the actual improvement of government services and infrastructure up to international standards may yet be the best incentive to get us to pay the right taxes. This is Tony Abad for Political Capital. Thank you, and we'll see you again next Wednesday.